because you're pumping against the gradient. So this is a type of active transport that happens. So you're requiring energy. So if you're requiring energy, you're not going to have the energy to power this thing. That's why it sends them out, because it knows they're going to come right back in because of diffusion. And so when they come in, that's what, this is an um, energy releasing process because it's becoming more stable. So that energy in that gradient is being used to power ATP synthase. That's what chemiosmosis is, is using some sort of gradient to provide energy. And that's exactly what's happening here in chemiosmosis. Other questions? Okay. All right. So, um, we've talked about cellular respiration and we've talked about photosynthesis and we know that they're opposite reactions, right? Photosynthesis, since we're building sugar molecules, that's going to be an endergonic process that requires energy. And then cellular respiration, you're breaking down molecules, so that's going to be an exergonic reaction that releases energy. And both of these pathways have been around forever. Like we said, these were around in the very first, maybe not the very first, but soon after the very first organisms. Because, you know, living organisms, like we said, they need energy to survive. And so they developed these pathways over millions of years of evolution. And so you end up with a mechanism for making energy. And then the opposite mechanism, the mechanism for using energy to make sugar. And so this is the relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And again, the products of cellular respiration serve as the reactants for photosynthesis and vice versa. Now, there's this theory called endosymbiosis. And what endosymbiosis, remember endo means into, or into and symbiosis means two things working together harmoniously. And so what this the theory of endosymbiosis, endosymbiosis is, is it explains where these mitochondria and these chloroplasts came from. So remember, we, there are three organelles that all have their own DNA, their own ribosomes, and the double phospholipid bilayer. You've got the nucleus, you've got the mitochondria, and you've got the chloroplast. And so because these chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own DNA and their own ribosomes, you know, they're self-sufficient. They can take care of themselves. They don't need the rest of the cell or the nucleus to help them. And so this theory is based on that kind of evidence. And there's lots of other evidence that we're not going to get into. But it's thought that these mitochondria and these chloroplasts were at one point their own organisms, capable of or having these precise qualities. So the chloroplast was some, and it was believed it was a type of um, algae, a single-celled algae cell um, that eventually got consumed by a eukaryotic cell. And instead of digesting it like it would anything else it takes in, it realized that it was a process capable of, you know, either photosynthesizing or making ATP in cellular respiration. And so each of these organelles, because, like you said, they're self-sufficient in the cell, so they can survive on their own. And so this is the main basis for them being thought to be their own organisms, and each one had its own unique qualities, and so was taken on by eukaryotic cells and different cells. So in the plant cells, at some point, some, you know, something engulfed this chloroplast and then realized that it was capable of making sugar and that was helping the plant grow. And then the mitochondria, you know, it was engulfed into a eukaryotic cell and the cell, instead of destroy destroying it, was like, ooh, this is good. It's making all this energy for me. I'm going to keep it. And so over the years, this endosymbiosis occurred. So you started off with two organisms. One gets engulfed and then kind of gets morphed into an organelle type thing. Like I said, there's lots of other evidence, um, you know, supporting this idea, but we don't really have time to go over it. Um, but just know that the theory of endosymbiosis is used to explain um, where mitochondria and where uh, chloroplast came from originally. So here we have the relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So in an autotroph, you're going to have both of these processes going on. But even among heterotrophs, 
you're still going to have cellular respiration, and our products of cellular respiration are still going to feed into photosynthesis. It's just going to happen in a plant and not in our bodies. And so when you look at photosynthesis, remember, in photosynthesis, we're taking the sun's energy or solar energy, we're taking water, and we're taking carbon dioxide. We're taking the electrons away from water and giving them to carbon dioxide in order to build sugar. And so what happens in the light reactions, remember the light reactions, what did I say, remember when we talk about the light reactions? Photosystem 2, electron transport chain, photosystem 1, electron transport chain, and ADPH. All right, so all that's going on in here in the light reactions. Yeah? Is the, um, the electron transport chain the same as in cellular respiration? Is it the same process? Or no, so cellular respiration, all of this is cellular respiration. So, so this, 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 this. And these. That's all cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is a big, complicated process. Yeah. And it's broken into glycolysis, there's a transition period, Krebs cycle, and then oxidative phosphorylation. Oh, so there is no... There is the electron transport chain. But is it the same process of going, jumping from protein to protein? Yeah, that's what the electron transport chain okay. is. You're dropping off those electrons to try to give them to oxygen to make water. Okay. But that's only one part. That's like a sub-part. No, Cellular like respiration as a whole. Yeah. No, it's the same idea. An electron transport chain is an electron transport okay. chain. Yeah. And so you have them in photosynthesis and cellular respiration, and they do the same thing. Okay. Just the mechanism and the direction of those hydrogens is going to be a little bit different. But other than that, it's the exact same thing. All right. So in the light reactions, this is where we're taking those electrons away from water. And we're loading up our electron carrier in the form of NADPH. And remember, because of this, these electron transport chains that are in between these photosystems, they're going to generate a little bit of energy. And so the products of the light reactions are going to be your NADPH and your ATP. And then you're also going to have oxygen as a byproduct. And then that, those feed into the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle where you're taking those electrons that you just took away from water and now you're giving them to carbon dioxide. And so you're building the sugar molecule in the Calvin cycle. So your product is going to be glucose and NADP positive and ADP. And so then the products of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water, will feed directly into cellular respiration. So again, we have glycolysis, so the product of the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis is going to be sugar. That can just then be immediately fed into glycolysis, where it's going to be broken down into pyruvate. We're loading up our electron carriers. It'll then be made into acetyl-CoA, and then it'll feed into the Krebs cycle. And this is where glucose continues to be oxidized until, um, until you end up with um, carbon dioxide. And so... Once you go through the Krebs cycle, now that we've taken all those electrons, we send them down the electron transport chain and give them to water, or sorry, give them to oxygen in order to form water. And so the products of the light reactions will feed into the dark, I'm sorry, the product of photosynthesis will feed into cellular respiration. And the products of cellular respiration will feed back into photosynthesis. So these cycles are always going to be linked together. One of them is going to require energy, and the other one's going to release energy. Just a quick clarify, <coughs> glucose is going to be the product of the Calvin cycle? Yes. And the end of photosynthesis. That's pretty much the product of the Yes, glucose. that's the main goal of photosynthesis, to make sugar. Okay. Yeah. And then at the end of the uh, cellular respiration, that end product is going to be H2O, or excuse me, oxygen. Yeah, well, oxygen's a byproduct because you're starting, or sorry, um, at the end of cellular respiration, the product is going to be water. And so we have the electron transport chain, we have oxygen as our final electron acceptor, so when we send them down the electron transport chain in cellular respiration, um, that's where we're um, generating this energy and generating the H2O, because we're giving the electrons to oxygen from all of your NADs and your FADs that you've generated. So like we said, the first two parts, glycolysis and Krebs cycle, their job is to take as many electrons away from glucose as possible. It's a simple way to do it. They're just collecting electrons on these NADHs and these FADH2s. And so once they gather those electrons, 
Now they're going to give them to oxygen. And the way they do that is through the electron transport chain. And so when those electrons meet up with oxygen, that's where you're going to get water as a byproduct. And then the energy that's produced is a direct result of chemiosmosis and of the electron transport chain. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so if you compare photosynthesis and cellular respiration to one another, you can see that you know, the effects are going to be opposite of one another. So um, as far in terms of food and photosynthesis, it's going to be made. You're making sugar, right? Whereas in cellular respiration, you're breaking it down. Um, energy is going to be required in photosynthesis because we're building. And then in respiration, since we're breaking down, or I'm sorry, in, um, in photosynthesis, energy is going to be required. And in respiration, energy is going to be released. In photosynthesis, light is required, but it doesn't matter in cellular respiration. In water, it's going to be broken down in photosynthesis. And then it's going to be created in cellular respiration. Same thing with carbon dioxide. It's going to be used by photosynthesis to build sugar, and then it's going to be released as a result of the Krebs cycle in cellular respiration. And then oxygen will be released in photosynthesis, but will be utilized in cellular respiration. So all the products and all the starting materials are going to be opposite in terms of whether or not they are consumed or whether or not um, they are created. Okay, um, let's go over this and do a little review. All right, so number one, how is cellular respiration related to breathing? <laughs> to break it down a little bit, I'm not using too many big terms, but cellular respiration, it's going to be taking the oxygen that we take in and it's going to be exhaling, you know, CO2. That's going to be the product that we're going to be getting from it. So, yeah, essentially that's it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're generating this carbon dioxide as a direct result of cellular respiration. So we're starting with glucose, removing all these electrons from it until you end up with carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide is created, it's released into the atmosphere. Greg? No. Alan, I don't know why I'm going to call you Greg. All right. Number two. Why do the reactions of respiration, um, that's, we can ignore that one. We did not discuss that. Um, where is ATP synthase located in eukaryotes? Mitochondria. <laughs> in the mitochondria. Um, what about in plant cells? In plant cells, it, isn't it still in the mitochondria? And no, in, the in photosynthesis. Oh, in it's still going to be in the mitochondria and plant cells. Well, but it's all no. It's going to be in the chloroplast. Well, I, I mean, yes, the, yes. Your plant cells are still going to perform yeah. cellular respiration, but they're also yes. I knew it. Okay. Also. Yeah. So you could say the mitochondria <laughs> and the chloroplasts. All right. And the prokaryotes <laughs> and the cytoplasm. Yes. All right. What is the net gain of ATP for each glucose in glycolysis? Um, Patrick. Two ATP. Two ATP. Yeah, glycolysis is going to make two ATP. Krebs cycle is going to make two ATP. And then oxidative phosphorylation is going to make 32 to 34. Um, okay. What is the role of oxygen in the electron transport chain? Michelle? Yes, yeah, the final electron acceptor. So it's going to be the one collecting all the electrons that we've been gathering. And when you add those electrons to water, I'm sorry, to oxygen, you're going to make water. Cyanide blocks the final transfer of electrons to oxygen. So what will happen if we consume cyanide? All right, what's going to be the physical, the chemical effects? I mean, obviously we're going to die. <laughs> Why are we going to die, though? Yeah, go ahead. You got an idea? Yeah, if you don't have, if you don't, if you can't transfer these electrons to oxygen, 
then that means you're not going to be able to use that proton gradient generated by the electron transport chain. You're not going to be able to finish the rest of the process. So chemiosmosis, never going to happen. So if you block the transfer of electrons to oxygen, you're essentially cutting off the rest of cellular respiration. And the rest of cellular respiration is the most important part. That's where you make all the energy. So if you're cutting off the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, you're not going to be able to make energy. And if you can't make energy, you're going to die. So even though we have fermentation as a backup mechanism, fermentation can't keep up with our constant demand for ATP. So you would enter, you eventually, your, shell, your cells would shut down because they're not, they don't have any energy, so they can't do any work, so they can't do their jobs. Okay. Um, name? Candace. Candace. Okay. All right. Compare and contrast aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. Anybody that hasn't gone yet? In uh, aerobic, you get the production of uh, oxygens, and in the ana uh, anaerobic, you don't have a production of oxygen, uh, something else you get, the like an uh, electron, and uh, so forth, and uh, you have a CO2. In the uh, problematic, you get the uh, yeast and the uh, bacteria, mm -hmm. and they are using the, uh, again, both to both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so one thing you said that was a little bit incorrect, though, you said that aerobic respiration was the production of oxygen, and anaerobic is not. That's not the case. So we're not making oxygen. What we're doing is, is we are releasing oxygen in photosynthesis, but in cellular respiration, we're making water. All right, we're using oxygen as a reactant, but when we take those electrons and they go down the electron transport chain and meet up with oxygen, it's going to form water. The aerobic and anaerobic just talks about what is the final electron acceptor. So in aerobic respiration, it's going to be oxygen at the bottom of the electron transport chain. In anaerobic, it's going to be something else other than oxygen. All right? But um, yes, so all three of these processes are going to use glycolysis, all three of these processes are going to start with pyruvate, and all three of these processes are going to generate energy. They just do it in a little bit different ways. So we already discussed the difference between anaerobic and aerobic. So what about fermentation? So fermentation, again, is going to use glycolysis and pyruvate and then break that down to release energy, um, some NAD positives, and a couple other things, depending on whether you're talking about um, lactic acid fermentation or alcohol fermentation. All right, um, last one. Explain the evolutionary links between respiration and photosynthesis. Anybody who hasn't answered one yet? No, no? Ah, yes. Yeah, that's that, exactly. That's the theory of endosymbiosis. Um, and the fact that these two pathways, you know, once they were created years ago in evolution, they started working together in order to make energy and to use that energy to make sugar. And so the theory of endosymbiosis is also um, correlates these two um, together. All right, any questions? All right, so I'll see you on Wednesday, the lecture. And I will bring, for those of you who didn't get your test back, I'll bring those on Wednesday. Make sure you turn in your homework before you leave. Yeah, separate pile.